Liverpool, you have a vampire. Chapter 3. A journey at sea. The captain explained to me the workings of the ship. He gave me a tour that lasted till the sun was high in the sky directly above our heads. He also revealed to me, in his bombastic voice, how I came to be the captain of this wonderful vessel, a ship of such modern ideas. This man was tall, his skin was dark, dark brown. His muscular physique pushed out of his clean white shirt. His face had the contour of a marble statue. He was a man of calibre. This you could feel whilst listening to him, as he regaled his story thus far. He spoke many languages which he learned during his voyages on board the Vampira Celeste, while scouring the earth with Miss Etienne. As he spoke to me with a strong voice, he recounted his tale. I was 17, fishing off a lagoon at the western coast of my homeland in Africa, a place I had fished many times as a boy and a man, a place I was supposed to always fish. Offshore, a big ship had dropped its anchor, such the likes I had not seen before. It was not the kind of vessels we had built. It had different sails and flew flags I did not know, with a crew I did not recognise as my own people. Their skin was fair and the hair on their heads was the colour of sand. I later came to learn that these were Europeans. History would later write that one day at Porto Santo off the coast of West Africa in the year of our Lord 1418 is when the first Europeans came to the African continent. They returned a number of times over the years, creating trade routes, but also bringing the pox, violence, the Bible, death and illness. We were fishing at night alone. The moon was its usual big self in the sky. The forest was teeming with the noises of nocturnal animals, but that was in the distance. I was some ways away from the shore. The stars lit the water like sparkles in a fire. Always a scene of calm and ease, when suddenly we were ambushed by a number of men. They jumped aboard the fishing boat, they put me down and began to tie my hands and feet. They were all about fixing chains to my neck. I struggled and fought with all my strength. But with four big men, the surprise they seized me with gave me no advantage to fight. During the struggle and tussle, I dived into the ink-black water with the hope of swimming away. But in my escape beneath the waves, my hands had been secured as well as my feet. I began to sink quick. I seemed to drop faster to the deep in my struggle to remove the ropes. But I could not release myself from the ropes made tight by my ambushes. I was dropping quick to the seabed, dark and deep where sharks lived and snakes had the length of two men. I gasped. I sat listening to his tail with gaping mouth, trying to not be in the shoes of the captain. But I could see each scene with vivid clarity as I swallowed each gulp of water he had. I was there with him as he sank beneath the ebbing waves, falling into cloudy darkness. He continued his tale as he played and looked at his hands, rubbing the tips of his fingers with his thumbs. He spoke again in a soft voice that was low in tone. I was brought awake on the deck of this very ship. Miss Etienne had cleared my lungs, blowing air into my mouth, which pushed the water swallowed out of my body. I began to splutter, coughing out all I had consumed. My eyes opened from being half dead. I startled to awake, shifting left and right in fear for my very life. She greeted my frightened face with a smile. A warm feeling filled me. All threat was gone. Ease ran over my body. Looking into them green eyes, she spoke to me in assurance of the sanctuary she offered. Also explaining the sudden attack. An attack which I had experienced some hours before. It had taken some time for me to recover. The men who had ambushed me were slave traders, she explained, and have been randomly kidnapping people across the continent of Africa. She had saved me from a fate worse than death. I came to see what slavery was for some unfortunates as I travelled the earth. I was not a prisoner of the mistress, nor was I to be enslaved. She offered me sanctuary and adventure, which I could leave at any time. Miss Etienne allowed me to stay aboard the ship as long as I wished. She gave me the opportunity to return to my own lands. I was free to leave the ship any time, but all that night she gave me an account of her travels. She illustrated their journeys, my mind created huge scenes sewn like tapestries the size of a farmer's field. I was smitten and very curious to know more. I was intrigued by her knowledge of the world. She explained very clearly what she had seen. He stopped speaking for a second. 
He had a pencil drawing in a small frame on his table, which was the head and shoulders of Miss Etienne. He caressed it with his fingers as he spoke, gazing at the picture. I was also enamoured by her beauty. I had not ever seen a woman with fair skin, or had I seen such green eyes before in my life. I was transfixed, spellbound and dumbstruck. She exuded a warmth which I felt inside where my heart was supposed to be. If the mistress was a goddess, then I would gladly be one of her subjects. The captain spoke, holding one of my hands in his two hands. He looked into my eyes with meaningful concentration. Miss Etienne has found you. She has for years felt a feeling which has troubled her soul. The captain outlined a number of aspects of this strange existence they live, how they sail the circumference of the world, never travelling the same route more than once, crossing every ocean from east to west, north to south. All that day as we travelled through the seas at the end of Europe, I was shown about the ship and introduced to all the crew that manned the ship, 15 and all. They all had particular jobs which they could swap and change as the weeks rotated. A number handled the lower decks, a group had the middle deck and the rest manned the sails. However, both men and women worked on the sails. They were operated with a sophisticated mechanism which would become a modern idea used by every sailing vessel of the future, a system which Etienne had built herself. The captain took me to his cabin which was immaculate, tidy and comfortable. It had paintings hung on a big table with maps, quills and instruments that seemed used to navigate the world on its ocean. He sat at his big table, poured drinks for two and glasses made thin. He spoke to me, looking out of the porthole as waves splashed and disappeared. He looked at me smiling and spoke. Do you know where you are? Do you know where you've been? You're in the darkest reaches of the Siberian Ocean. Beyond here none travels to return. This is where cold meets cold and they form an alliance of ice. Ice so high and thick it reaches beyond the clouds. Miss Etienne is a skilled seafaring sailor who has captained this vessel more than once around the world. I have traversed this journey with her a number of times already. We travel here when we've seen all we have needed to see for this decade. He observed me, looking into my eyes, making sure I was listening very carefully. He spoke again. Miss Etienne is a vampire, you understand? I nodded, knowingly, slow. She is a soul who has no place in God's heaven, or is there room for her in all the devil's hell? She will live and die from this mortal pain. With no chance of a saviour saving his soul, the life of a vampire is long. The will to be a vampire takes strength and commitment. There are two things at play here. The first thing is either Miss Etienne chose you to be here forever and ever. The second, or you have somehow in the workings of this strange thing called life, you have sent a signal to her heart, maybe without you knowing, which has travelled across the distance of time and place. You have in some way reached out to her. I was stunned with no words. I spoke rapidly, making only sense of myself. I, I have never sent a signal. Or have I ever wanted anyone other than my Mary? I know not what Miss Etienne has built in her mind, or could I be sure that she is full and whole in her mental state of being? I have never left my homestead, or have I prayed for anything other than food and a roof over my head? I have been a simple man who has worked hard in the life I have lived this far. The captain stood walking around the table. He pulled a rolled up map from a pile in the box. It was not a ship's map. He explained that this map was a horoscope of the stars and the moons. He told me, Miss has followed your line. When your moon was rising in Cancer, when the stars were aligning to your birth, when this star here was to be at its brightest in the sky, she knew then that you were her destiny. You and her share all the same rises and moon occupations. You are from the same universe. Her stars and yours have to be aligned for the rest of the stars in the sky to be at one. If you did not collide as you have, there will be terrible futures ahead. I was dumbstruck and could not fathom how he understood this strange map. How could I understand what this divine providence means? It seems to me like the work of witches and shaman, a world of crystal balls and ancient superstition, which I did not believe in my previous life. I was but a simple being with no real life experiences, but here now in the realm of the Sherpa. 
It could be a magic that is real. A world beyond the veil where reality stops and the magical world begins. Where the rules of science play no part in this dominion of magic and death, life, destiny and what the future may hold. The past has very little bearing here on the reality I now know and see. I spoke, scared, of what fear I wasn't sure. I have a small understanding of what you're saying, that destiny has brought the mistress to my shores. She believes that her and I are destined to be together, or the rest of the world will fall into a deep hole of despair. He nodded. I continued to speak. I am a simple man. For such thoughts to be grasped and understood will take some time. I felt this to be the best response I could give until we reach land where I may find the opportunity for escape. He spoke, looking at the framed picture. The mistress will be happy. In turn, you will be happy. I looked at the man adorning the image. Could it be he loved the mistress? I asked him. Is that love in your eyes? We are not to fight a duel at sunset, are we? He laughed a hearty laugh, calling a name aloud with affection. A female of grace and height came in and lit up the cabin on her entrance, a beauty God had made once only. Like Miss Etienne, he'd broken the mould when casting a lucre. Hey, my husband, what are your needs or have you discovered some new place on the map? She looked at me, smiling. She spoke. Mrs. found him. He nodded to her. A lucre, my love. This is our guest. He is scared and unsure of many things. Looking at me whilst holding her about the waist, he spoke. I have loved Miss Etienne in a number of ways. I have loved her for a number of years. But I have loved my wife, Luca, for much longer than Miss Etienne. What he did not say when explaining his first night on the Celestial Vampire was that when he was ambushed, he was alone with his wife. She had been kidnapped by the sailors in the dark. They had put chains to her hands and feet, but he had gotten away into the inky black sea escaping the clutches of this evil crusade. When Miss Etienne brought him to breath, when he found his bearings, he asked Miss if she would aid him in rescuing his wife. It would be a hard task from the slave traders who had seized the Luca, who had intention to sell her as a slave, to take her to the new world. His arms tightly around his tall wife's waist, he told a story to me where he gained the utmost respect and adoration for Miss Etienne. We were a crew of nine then, Six were vampire, three were not. We were one day sailing through the waves on course to where the ship was heading. Miss had already assumed I would want to rescue my wife. She witnessed the whole event. She at times swam vast areas of sea to calm her lust for human blood. On this night she was doing exactly that. When she happened by chance to see what was afoot. She had seen the ambush of me, my body falling into the deep blue sea. Aluka being torn from the sailing boat and took to the big ship offshore. Aluka smiled and held her man tight. She kissed his hair and head, stroking painted fingernailed hands around his chin. He carried on speaking. We had caught up with the moving ship just as night was coming up ahead. Miss played cat and mouse with the vessel, allowing her to see us, but to be too far away for any attack to have threat upon us. But when night was in that utter darkness, it gets when moving close to black. That is when she decided to rescue Aluka. Using all her vampire powers and strength, he leaned in to speak. As we sailed towards the ship, Miss asked me to forgive her for what I was about to see. She said she would transform into the ugliest of God's creatures. She claimed her beautiful countenance would disappear and only a demon could be seen. As we drew closer to the ship, she transformed into something I had not seen before. I have seen shame and take the presence of an animal. I have witnessed witches speak of futures to come. I have recoiled at the rolling eyes of people in trance, covered my ears to those who speak in tongues, but never have I seen such a vision. A subtle metamorphosis, as if from a butterfly to a butterfly with dangerous hind teeth, but still the beauty of its kind. Moreover, her beauty was still there. Only her mouth transformed at her hind teeth, teeth that became that of a wolf. Her eyes were washed in a dark red mist and her lips the blackest red as red can be. They devoured the sailors of the slave ship, leaving only a few slaves and the Luca. The six vampires that had been at sea with Miss Etienne had not had human blood for some time. She and them drank blood warm till the morning sun came up. 
Then they drank some more. They left but a handful of slaves who turned the ship around, letting them travelling home with a ghostly story which none will believe. He spoke looking into his wife's eyes. For this alliance from Miss Etienne to rescue my Aluka will be a debt I could never repay, but one I have sworn to repay. If you'd only give me the chance to spend my life's journey with her in hope that one day by some odd chance I could show her the gratitude which I hold for her. We are not vampire, Aluka and I. We have chosen not to be vampires. We are the eyes of daytime. We are the view of what time is now for the people living in the present day. For vampires live ages, and ages are long. There comes change with the ages of time, new ideas with different ways of seeing our world. For this it all gets messed into one long journey, where there are no points of reference to mark the passing of time. You see, we stay with what is present. What are people doing now? What are they thinking? What is going through their minds? What is the future? We've seen many a sight. Our morality has been questioned more than once. But beneath God's hazing sky we are judged only by ourselves. I have never seen one left this mortal coil that had not deserved which came to them. I have only come to learn that with their passing it has left the world a better place. There have been monsters who have roamed this world who have not been vampire, demon or wolf. They have been men with beating hearts and ranging minds. The like the world can do without. But they will reoccur throughout the future, it seems. For some time I had no words. I couldn't speak or fathom the depth of this reality. What was real was that I was in the realm of vampires, as I was in a layer of something that was real, but unreal. Clarity was somewhere in the distance. But I asked a question which came from my open mouth. Am I to become a vampire? Do I have a choice? He placed his arms on the table leaning against my view. I believe you do have a choice. I also believe you will make the right choice. You can spend time considering the rest of your days or you can look into them green eyes of a deep ocean where destiny swims in the hope of catching love, the love that is you. You can swim or you can drown. Aluka pushed him. Don't be so pushy with our guest. He may not want to stay. She peered at me with a warming smile. We are a peaceful ship, and have but four cannons for defence only. Yes, there is death that we have seen more than once, but we have never attacked or swum the decks of pirates. We move from place to place. We seek only the solitude to farm and live in a peaceful manner. She held her man. She spoke through a smile. Take your time to think it through. We have all the time in the world. Miss has never asked us if we want to be vampires. She has allowed us to live as we choose. You too can live as you choose, as vampire or not. She will still love you, and in time you will love her. And Luca filled the glasses, kissed their captain on the cheek. I will leave you too. It will be dark soon and food will be prepared. She left the cabin humming a tune. I gazed for some time. The captain drank from the glass. He cleaned his table of the maps and inks, placing the maps in boxes and using shelves for the instruments of navigation. A music box in the shape of a heart occupied one of the shelves. The captain handled the ornate trinket. La Carpenter and Blacksmith made this for the pleasure of Miss Etienne. He opened the box, placing it on the table. He opened the lid. He played a beautiful lullaby, the notes of the mechanism with tones which hummed and resonated about the cabin. The sand painted on was a work of intricate art. So delicately constructed and formed, coloured red like blood and brushed with gold leaf beds. It was a wonderful sound. It seemed to permeate about the air, making all things angelic. He lifted his head and spoke. I will show you to your cabin where you can rest and contemplate your decisions for the future. We have a number of stops to make before we reach our homestead to farm the lands. He drew close to me from his chair, placing his hand to my shoulder. If you choose to leave the celestial vampire, Miss will allow you passes to go wherever your heart desires. You can be embarked on another sailing vessel where eventually you will reach the shores of your home. He spoke no more. We listened to the music box ding its last note. 
He moved and stood at the door, raised his arm and bid me leave. Good rest you adieu. I have to hope you sleep with no dreams of woe. We will come for you when the sun is in the sky. The next morning from this morning now, I left the captain's cabin. On closing the door to my own place of rest, I threw myself to the wooden bed. I buried my face in the pillow of hay. All that day he spoke to me. His enigmatic wife, Aluka, welcomed me into the fold. It caused me the most confusion. I have slept and woke so many times since leaving Europe and the culture it keeps. I no longer count days or weeks, no longer felt like my own self. There was something present in my blood moving, something living, surging through my veins and mind. I slept at days like states of sleep, but could hear voices. I thought I could hear howling intermittently. Rolling in my single pairs and bedding, rocking from side to side as the sea pushed the ship through an ocean black towards a place unknown. I was gone, knocked out. No dreams vividly played and no memories went fleeting by. At night time the ship took on a life of its own. Beneath God's clear moon vampires danced and swam amongst the sharks and waves. The other crew members slept. The humans, some of them maintained steady navigation of the ship's destination. At the helm and controlling the sails using levers on the deck, it took but one or two people to sail this vessel. One could manage the sails, whilst the other followed the trajectory of a compass placed at the helm. We were heading for a small holding beyond the Russian Peninsula. La Ventier, which was latitude 65.5835486 at longitude-171.0389249, the captain assured me. It was a tiny keep. Much like that of my hometown back home in Liverpool. Liverpool. I have not thought of here for some time. 